so we, as we come into this place and this space to worship Almighty God. The time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So if the choir can shuffle out somehow, unless you're pinned in, I will sing by way of intro to you. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Brian, where have you? Yeah, I, I, I was looking to you going back to your seat. Brian's going to read to us now from the book of Jonah. Today, reading Jonah, chapter 2, verse 1. Jonah goes to Nineveh. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I gave you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the pro proclamation he issued in Nineveh. 
by the decree of the king and his nobles. Do not let people or animals tear their flocks a senesay. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion come from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring in them the destruction he had threatened. Amen. Amen. And this is the word of the Lord. We now sing as a welcome to people who come to worship verse 1 of the hymn 198 if you have a hymn book in front of you but it's on the screen let us build a house see the screen too well, there should be wee cards on the pews. The world belongs to God. The earth and its people are His. How good and lovely it is to live together in unity. Love and faith come together. Justice and peace join hands. And if the Lord's disciples kept silent, these stones would shout aloud. Lord, open our lips. And our lives shall Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forevermore. Amen. Sultan is now going to come and lead us in our opening prayer. Let's join our hearts in prayer. We praise your holy name, Lord God Almighty. We praise you, for you yourself are love. And we can enjoy your presence in our life every day. We praise your holy name, Almighty, for you are good. And your goodness and your mercy is in our life. We do thank you, Father God, for this time together that we could gather and we can know that your mercy brought us together. Thank you, Father, for this day. We are grateful for it as we know that lots of people could not wake up this morning. But we are still here. And you have a plan for us. A plan what only you know. But we are seeking your will. We are seeking to know the way we need to go on. So Father, we are praying that you come and be with us. That your word may be proclaimed. And we are praying for your Holy Spirit to work in our hearts and minds 
that we may understand your will. That our hearts might be humble and obedient to you. Father, blessed be your name. This is what we pray for at this time. And we call you Lord. That by your spirit you come and rest upon us. And we are praying for Donna. That you be with him as he preach your word. <coughs> that it might be your message. Father, be with us. We pray for this. And we also pray for our friends and families who could not come this morning to Esther. We pray and call you now. In the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior and <coughs> His altar and thanks be to God. Laura, where are you? There. Laura's going to read to us from First Corinthians. This is the word of the Lord, and thank you, Laura. <coughs> Angus and Andrea are now going to come up and sing us the, the piece that they do every Sunday uh, for us, and I'll let them introduce the song.
it took you by surprise, didn't it? Thanks, Angus and Andrea. A song about how God's love keeps on going on. It's like an echo, echo, echo. We have a sense of humour in this congregation. <coughs> At least somebody's laughing. Our gospel reading is from Mark, Mark chapter 1, in fact, and the verses 14 through to 20, a section of scripture I'm pretty sure most of you, if not all, are aware of. Let's hear the words of God. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James son of Zebedee and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. And without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and they followed him. Amen, and thanks be to the Lord for all the readings we've had from his most holy word. And to his name be all the glory, the honour, and the praise. Amen. We usually have a very short prayer at this stage. Let's pray. Lord, be in our hearing, but also in our listening. Be in our thinking but also in our understanding. And Lord, be in our hearts and in our doing the things that you would have us do in the name of and for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. <coughs> Amen. That might come as a surprise to some of you, but ministers are always scrapping around for material when it comes to delivering a message because some of us at least try to keep it as fresh as possible. We would like to think that what we have to say is not only interesting but we dig down into our soul and pray and hope that the word that we bring is also inspiring. So we scrap around all over the place looking for things to help us and sometimes, sometimes, we even look back on material that we've used in the past just to remind us and to help orientate us about where we've been and where we're going. And I did that for this Sunday. I looked around, dug into some of the old material, and I found something that made the hairs in the back of my neck stand up. Now I can assure you I don't get excited usually about the things that are written. But this really did strike me. And my response was, oh Lord. So I'm going to quote myself from something I said years ago in another place and in another time. And the words were these. People think twice these days about going to the Middle East on holiday or on pilgrimage. Tensions are high with the Israel and Palestinian question being far from resolved. Jewish and Arab political claims clash with people from the West sometimes through good intentions adding fuel to the fire. 
Political and theological ignorance are the conditions which lead to very real violence. A violence that in our global village comes too close to home. I mentioned that years ago in a completely different church time and place and I'm pretty sure you can see why the hairs of my own neck stood up that something that I had written years ago about the Palestinian question because it struck me like oh Lord how prophetic that understanding was of the situation in the Middle East and look where we are today I don't claim to be a prophet or a clairvoyant but it made me sit up and realize that as Christian people we have to keep our eyes on our world for God's sake because the tensions in the Middle East go back generations and centuries and even thousands of years. Friends, the world has always been a troubled place. And it was a troubled place when Jesus came to this earth and proceeded on his ministry. The situation that he faced was no fraught, less fraught with political tension and yes, indeed, violence. As Greek and Roman and Jewish culture clashed and the story should be all too familiar to us as Christian people. So Jesus stepped in to a bubbling cauldron of wayward confusion. But what does he say in the midst of all of that? He says in the midst of all of that trouble <coughs> and violence. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. So there's two things in that statement that tell us what we should do as the kingdom of God is near. One is to repent and the other is to have faith. Repentance and faith. Two words we are familiar with in church circles. But we might ask, well, what are people being asked to repent of? Well, like the Pharisees, we could go around making a list of all the rules that we have broken, all the sins that have been committed, and in confessional fashion, tick them off one by one. But the call to repentance is much more profound than that. Mark doesn't go into any kind of detail like that throughout his gospel. And his economy of words, I think, are deliberate. Because what people have to repent of back then, and what people have to repent of now, is a general godlessness that leads to wrongdoing in the first place. I had a wee blether with a couple of my elders before I came in here, lamenting that churches are not full across the land the way you, they used to be. And what a difference it makes when we're all together like this. We fool ourselves if we think that empty pews and empty buildings don't affect us. Of course they do, because we hearken back to a day when buildings were fuller, fuller than they are just now. But the reason why our churches are not full anymore is because of the general godlessness 
in our society. We are no longer living in a Christian country. We are secularized. And God gets pushed aside. And people go their own way and do their own thing. In fact, they sin as we all do. So I'm not saying that we are better people. But those of us who still worship God, still have a belief in a God that can make a difference. And we understand that we need to say, sorry Lord, why is it I've not passed on the gospel? Sorry Lord, why are we as churches not getting the gospel into our community? So yes, we all have to repent. But so does the rest of society. <coughs> The trouble is they're so far from God now <coughs> that they don't know what they have to repent of. But what we all need to repent of is those times when God is not to the fore of our lives and we're not living according to his will. That was the whole point of Jonah, wasn't it? He had to go to a godless people, a people who had forgotten who he was, and he was given it. No way. Have you seen that lot? Or in time, he was persuaded to go and to speak to the people of Nineveh. And for his pains, he was chucked off a boat, swallowed by a big fish, spewed out, makes it to Nineveh. And what do they do? They repent because they hear the word of God. They go and put on sackcloth and sit in ashes to show how serious they were about their business. Maybe if the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland put on sackcloth and sat in ashes, we'd be much further forward than we are but if we require that of the highest gathering of our denomination, if we ask it of the assembly, we have to ask it of ourselves as well. What do we have to do to convince God that we are penitent? Penitent and receiving the good news and being so excited about that that we can't but tell it to other people. That's kind of what draws people like Zoltan and myself into the ministry. There was a day when we got excited about the gospel and wanted to tell other people, lots of people, to tell the world. Are we so excited now? Well, I don't know about you, Zoltan, but it's hard to keep it up. But we are, because if we weren't facing what we face, we wouldn't be here still doing what we're doing. And so I'm encouraging us that we need to get excited about the gospel once more. Because Jesus was saying to the disciples, the kingdom of God is near. And so I have to teach you how to fish for men. People might be cynical these days and think, well, because we're living in a land that's secularized and the churches are not as busy as they used to be, what's happening to Christianity? But the fact is, whether you realize it or not, at least to statistically speaking, get my teeth sorted out now, at least statistically <coughs> speaking, there are 2.2 billion adherents to the Christian faith approximately in the world today. It's still the biggest and fastest growing religion in the world. And that amounts to about 31% of the world's population. So the game is far from over. We are still the biggest religion 
throughout the world. Now you can argue about how many of them are real Christians and all the rest of it. You can do that when you go home. But the point is that statistically, <coughs> the faith still makes an impact. So just take a moment and think what might be possible if the Western world was to waken up <coughs> once again to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because we have more people alive on the planet now than at any other point in history. And the West, my friends, when it comes to Christian faith, is getting sluggish and sleepy. So think of the difference that would make to our world if we all woke up and all of a sudden thought we need to get out there and tell the good news. And what did Jesus do to achieve that? He took ordinary people, fishermen, and said, follow me. And I will teach you to fish for people. Fishing's not easy, is it? It's a hard trade, and it, even with all today's technology, I don't know if you watched all these documentaries and things about guys going out into the ocean with their fancy new boats and their electronics, but the one thing that they still have to contend with, just like they did 2,000 years ago, is the weather. And what these guys, and sometimes girls these days, do on the deck of a ship that's getting thrown all over the place to make sure that you and I are fed, is in my mind pretty awesome. But it's hard and it's dangerous. And Jesus said to the disciples, come. I'll teach you how to fish for people. And all of you know that that is hard and it's dangerous. It's hard because people treat you with suspicion. It's hard because people do not understand you. And it's dangerous because you might be ridiculed and it's dangerous because some Christians still die for their faith, even in the 21st century. Jesus wasn't implying it was an easy thing, but he was saying it's something we have to do. If people have any hope of hearing the gospel, as Paul tells us clearly, if they're to hear it, first of all, you need to tell it. And we're all called to do that. Not just ministers, not just elders and deacons, not just youth workers, but the entire church is expected in one way or another to do that. And I would postulate, my friends, that we've been rubbish at it for quite some time. We've been doing things the same old way, week in, week out, month in, month out, Sunday in, Sunday out. And we're not getting anywhere. And there was a point where the disciples were out fishing one day. Do you remember this story? And they cast their nets over the boat. And did they catch anything? No. And they were slogging away, pulling in nets, throwing it out pulling in nets, throwing it out. No doubt, like the rest of us, being discouraged. And somebody appeared to them. Who was that somebody? Jesus. Who was that somebody? Jesus. Are you ashamed of him? <laughs> Who was that somebody? Jesus. And what happened? He said to them, cast your net on the other side. Do something a bit different for a change. And what happened? Amen, brother. The nets were full. 
Now I know we're grumping and we're groaning about having to worship in other buildings and move from place to place. And the ministers are doing strange things like trying new service times, introducing new music. Just not like the good old days, but the good old days were good in the old days, but not now. And we have to do things differently. And maybe if we cast our nets on the other side, we'll catch the fish. And that's kind of what we're doing with this cluster thing. Is it nice being along in a, a, a bigger crowd? Of course it is. There's something about supporting one another. So it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a new thing. It's not an old thing. And so as we progress with trying to do the impossible, stopping the decline in our old institution, then maybe Jesus is just saying, now is the time to change how you do it. Come, follow me, and I'll teach you again how to fish for men, and we have to do it a bit more differently. This is a scary and a difficult world, but it's always been like that. And we have to go forward with the hope that by keeping our eyes focused on Jesus Christ, by casting our nets on the other side, maybe, just maybe, if we have faith, then things will begin to change. For the kingdom of God is near, but there's two things that we have to do. We have to repent and we have to have faith. The proximity of Christ's kingdom is signified by a people who have repentant hearts and are willing to respond to the call to serve. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you leave yourself behind and never be the same? For the kingdom of God is near. It is. It's so very very near and a fallen and difficult world should be part of our motivation to go out there and to tell other people about <coughs> his kingdom Amen and thanks be to God for the preaching of his word and to his name be all the glory the honour Let's sing that together now in 533 in the paper if you're using the paper. But it is on the screen. Will you come and follow me? <coughs>
Please be seated. In Psalm 51, in verse 10, it says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Angus and Andrea are now going to lead us in a, what I suspect is a newish song for many of you, and it's called Purify My Heart. I'll let you remain seated for this because as many as possible have to see the screen, but it's Purify My Heart. <laughs> when I heard you all singing the word holy I felt it it's new to you but you got the word holy and it was almost like almost I don't want you to get too big headed <laughs> it was almost like a heavenly choir so I'm, we're going to sing that one again because it's new to you and don't be afraid the words are not uh, complicated but think about the words I choose to be holy. We choose to be more God-like. 
in the face of a godless world. So let's try it once more. thought of our troubled world. We have thought of the challenges of being your people and the call to make a difference in this world. And we can do so by being holy. Not self-righteous, but holy and set apart for the work of your kingdom. Father, we sometimes look at our world and wonder what we can do. And one thing that each and every one of us can do is to be your people. To choose to be holy. To proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. For it is as near now as it was when Jesus told it to the first disciples. And so with that we do pray for our world and all its troubles. Asking what we can do to make a difference to the glory of Jesus Christ. 
to be holy, to be your people. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Lord, we confess that it's hard to be steadfast when we're discouraged. But might we leave this place today encouraged that you are still with us, that the kingdom of God is near. And so when we pray for our dearest, nearest and dearest, our loved ones, our families and friends, and ask you to make a difference, you hear our prayer, O Lord. So make a difference to those who are on our hearts and minds, whose names we bring before you and whose faces we see. Heal them, Lord, as only you can, for Christ is the true healer, giving us wholeness <coughs> and salvation. <coughs> even to eternity. So we have thankful hearts for what Jesus has done and is doing and for helping us to pray when we have difficulty by teaching the words he did to the disciples and saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, kingdom the power and the glory let's give glory to God in our first hymn if you're looking at paper it's 531 in the hymnal but it is on the screen my Jesus my saviour
If you stay stood standing, we'll sing a blessing to one another. It's on the screen. It's 786 if you want to look it up in the paper. May the God of peace be with us. Go with us. seated. Our facilities are not fantastic here but uh, the congregation has made tea and coffee so please if you have time and want to stay for tea and coffee do so. It will require you